Dr. Wen Lawson, an autistic lecturer, psychologist, researcher, advocate, and writer, has shared his professional and personal knowledge for nearly three decades. He has written and contributed to more than 20 books and authored more, many more academic papers. He serves on the board of the Autism Research Institute. These webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. And now, I will turn this over to Dr. Lawson. Thanks, Denise. Um, hello, everybody. <clears throat> I've had a coffee, <clears throat> so it might be a bit um, <clears throat> like that. I'll try not to. Um, so here in Australia, it's uh, just after eight in the morning, and um, I've been up a while, so it should be right. And I've had the coffee, <laughs> so it should be all right. This introduction slide for our topic about autism intersectionality, gender, um, and that will include sexuality. Just has some photos on of me in the black, black and white picture is me with my sisters. Um, the one on the right, you might recognize Temple. And I did some touring with her in the States a long time ago. And that picture's up there because she commented on my tie, which I thought was rather nice. Um, down below, you can see me, much younger me, with my mum. And there's a bit older with the grandchildren who are now much taller than me. Um, the picture of the magpie. Our magpies in Australia are very different to yours. Very friendly. And um, one particular magpie he, he called George come frequently and bring his wife and children. I know they don't really get married, but you kind of get what I mean. And um, we, we feed them. So a bit of a passion. I have a bit of a passion for birds and I put him in there. And there's my wife and I down in the corner. So we'll just that's just to give you a bit of a, um, an understanding of where we're coming from, where I'm coming from, um, and I'll continue. So um, which one do you have to do? Is it that one? Should <laughs> the the hope is that I'll continue. I'm pushing the button and the slide's not going down. What am I doing wrong? Don't know. Try again. Right. You might want to check your arrow keys one. Maybe try those. See if that yeah, works. Yeah, that's what I'm pushing the arrow keys. Oh, oh goodness. Okay. Uh, hover your mouse over the, maybe over the image and see if you click it. Okay, that worked. Thanks, Denise. Okay, so what you can expect from this talk, we will talk about gender and sexuality across some context um but initially i will i need to explain what autism is and it's really important because there's some a lot of myths out there about what autism is and we need to make sure that we get that right then i'll talk more about gender i won't say a lot about sexuality but um i will give you some um some aspects of it that i think are really important yeah so Read you a poem. Who am I? When looking out upon the world, I see as any might the things I notice, boy or girl, are captured within my soul. When looking out upon the world, I feel as any might. My heart can hurt, ache or break. My sense is heightened, set or curled. I live through day and night. But as you look in upon my world, your head might judge, your eyes not see the true reality that makes up me. Flesh and, <coughs> sorry about this, <coughs> flesh and bone of body image may not make them man. The clothes I wear may cause a stare, my choices may confuse. But what if she is not I am? What if he is not a man? This binary world imposed is set by those who propose male and female is set in time. And reality says there's not one line. So it's important to understand that gender, sexuality are in fact a spectrum and they're very different. Um, I should say that I'm an autistic researcher. Just I'm not sure if I've made that clear, but I'm autistic. My wife's autistic. Our kids and grandkids are too. And we're also, most of us ADHD. 
and some of us are PDA. And if anybody wants to know more about that, ask me a question when it comes to that part in our webinar. So physical attributes of the body alone do not make up one's gender or sexuality. Do not make up one's gender or sexuality. The physical attributes, so genitals, how our bodies look, should have turned the email off, that's all right. Um, don't make up our gender or sexuality. Autism is a spectrum. That means it's a, a broad variety of characteristics that impact someone's life quite differently. And so does our gender impact our lives and our autism very differently too. Gender and sexuality are also a spectrum. There are many characteristics of gender and sexuality that make up who we are as human beings, but they're very different. And of course, when you're looking at a person, um, you're also seeing their autism, their gender, their sexuality through their personality, through their culture, through the way that society has shaped and raised them and through their own choices. So autism is not one thing. There was a time when people sort of thought of autism as a, a linear thing. And excuse this language because it's pretty awful, but they talked about low functioning at one end and high functioning at the other. And it just is not like that. I'm a very supposedly high functioning autistic individual, PhD, associate professor, and all of those things, but I have lots of trouble doing my own shopping. Organising the washing up, I say to my wife, I'm happy to wash up, but uh, it's a little bit too messy at the moment, so she'll clear it up a bit for me. Um, there are lots of very sort of zigzaggy points, if you like, to how we function, how we present as autistic people. So sometimes I don't have any language. I'm so overwhelmed, that's the first thing to leave. And yet there's this opinion that autism, if you're low functioning, means you don't talk. And that's, that's awful, actually, because people can think if you don't talk, you don't think. Um, and it's certainly not like that at all. So yes, you can be autistic and have an intellectual disability or a difficulty cognitively. And um, that's a separate thing. To being autistic but when they co-occur plus epilepsy plus adhd plus a number of other things that also will impact on that picture of what we see being single-minded focused on things of interest to the individual is very much part of autism whoever we are as autistic people separating issues therefore like social public private all of those things can be very difficult. I mean, why is it okay to take your clothes off to go for a swim, but it's not okay to take your clothes off in a shopping center if you're hot? Why is it okay to touch yourself in private, but not in public? Uh, why do they call private conveniences, restrooms, toilets here in Australia, or the loo even, why do they call that private when if you go into the gents, there are lots of men standing there? So it can be very confusing to sort these things out, but obviously very important too. So I want to show you a video. I might not show you the whole thing because um, it might go a bit long, but you can look this up on YouTube. But this video, really lovely, really well split, explains autism as a matter of attention. Hi, I'm Quinn and I'm Autistic. Welcome to Autistomatic. Just checking that you can hear that? Yes, we can hear it. Okay, go back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Quinn and I'm Autistic. Welcome to Autistomatic. Ever since autism was first established as a diagnosis back in the 1940s, academics and scientists have theorised about us. They've dissected our brains and sequenced our genomes, 
and despite decades of published papers and some very well-paid careers and dubious honours, they still haven't found what they're looking for. Others have tried to explain our minds through observation of our behaviour like we would wild animals, but have failed to nail it down because they've been looking from outside. Daft ideas like extreme male brains and absent empathy would be laughable if they weren't so damaging. In the midst of all this noise and failure, there have been genuine leaps forward that autistic people have embraced because they do make sense to us. They genuinely help us because they provide an insight into our own minds, and in doing so, enable us to build personal strategies that help us navigate a world which seems to sabotage us at every turn. If you've watched my previous work, you'll likely be familiar with the double empathy problem. Double empathy is the brainchild of Damien Milton, who's autistic himself and has autistic children. Discovering double empathy was one of those moments in my autism journey that put a huge enthusiastic smile on my face. Here was a theory that made sense to me, that echoed my personal experience and ran parallel to observations I'd made about myself and autistic people I know. The same happened when I first read about monotropism. It made perfect sense. I could see myself in it, relate it to my experiences, and just like double empathy, it described not only my weaknesses and failings, but also my strengths and triumphs. Again, it germinated in autistic minds. Those of Dinah Murray, Wen Lawson, and Mike Lesser. Sadly, Dinah and Mike are no longer with us, but Wen is still working and writing in Australia. Monotropism is a theory about how the flow of our attention differs between autistic and neurotypical minds. Our attention is a finite resource. There's only so many things we can concentrate on before we start to make mistakes. The way we distribute our attention influences how we perform tasks, how we learn, how we mix with other people and even how we attend to basic needs. According to the theory of monotropism, the average neurotypical mind allocates significant attention to our surroundings, to the people nearby, and to thoughts and plans unrelated to our current situation. On top of our main focus, there are hazards to watch out for. People we may want to respond to, physical needs like hunger and fatigue, emotional states and plans for what we may do next, say next, or eat for dinner. If we had, for argument's sake, ten attention points to spend at any given time, five might be addressed to the task at hand, and the remaining five distributed amongst everything else. The monotropic mind allocates its resources very differently, though. Eight or nine of those ten points are dedicated to the task, leaving only one or two to other possibilities. When our attention is all on one thing, it gathers a force of its own, a mental momentum if you like, and this makes it hard to change direction. We can't just drop everything and change tack when we're asked to, because there's so much mental force propelling us in one direction. If someone tries to talk to us or our stomach starts rumbling, we're not only less likely to notice, it may take us a lot longer to react and to work out how to respond when we do. We have to slow down before we can start peeling away attention points to allocate to the new task, and that takes time and effort. OK, I'll stop that video there. This is freely available on YouTube, and there is a link in the uh, resources at the end, I hope. Um, so if you type in monotropism into YouTube, the name of that video is called One Step at a Time, and I... I recommend that you do. There's also a whole page of history, connections, updated papers, and a whole, whole lot of other things on the monotropism.org website. So let's talk a little bit about gender as in male and female. Being female and autistic has been poorly understood. I remember the days when they said, like, one in 10,000 autistic people might be female, one to three males. Well, that's definitely changed as we've become 
better aware and we've understand understood gender so much better too. It's roughly now one to one, pretty much the same. Autism is just as common in women and girls as it is in boys and men. And this is important to understand. It's also important to understand that it presents quite differently in females. So understanding autism over the years, a lot of research was done by males, a lot of writing done by males, and in a whole heap of variety of various situations, men have dominated. And that's also had an impact on what we've understood. So moving on from being thought of as a male condition once, um, we now understand that it's across all of humanity. It's expressed differently in females. Now, females have what we call a double X chromosome. Males have one X, one Y. And sex characteristics um, are within those chromosomes. And on the X, on the corner of the X chromosome, that's where it's coded for sociability. So if you've got two of those, you're more likely as a female to understand or at least be intrigued and drawn to social things slightly more than a man or a male with only one X. But don't get me wrong that this is very generalized, but it's to try and explain what we're seeing in, in girls. So you'll get quite a spectrum of femininity across uh, someone's life. Some people are ultra feminine. I remember my daughter wanting everything pink when she was a little girl. It's purple now. Um, but we've, we're kind of programmed pink for a girl and blue for a boy. A lot of us have moved way beyond that these days. But there's still, you know, that disposition when we're watching little people play and we, we see their, um, they're drawn to a whole heap of things. And traditionally, we've gone for toy cars and at least when I was growing up, um, boy toys and girl toys. Things are a bit more mixed around these days. But if a, if a boy was drawn more to a doll, it would freak us out. Hopefully, not so freaky these days because times have changed and we've come to understand that fuller spectrum of, of gender. Gender impacts communication and autism impacts communication. And in the traditional DSM-5, this is the the manual for various diagnoses. Um, there's this disposition that says autism will mean difficulties with communication, difficulties with kind of rigid thinking, um, and that's the attention bit. And that will impact how a person presents. And yet so many girls seem really good at eye contact. And if they have bad manners, we tend to say we're lacking in discipline. They may be strong-willed or extremely shy. And sometimes if we think about the words we use to describe a young person, it might give us a hint there might be something different going on. It might be beyond personality, it might not. We've got to look at that bigger picture. For girls, they'll say, she can't be autistic, she's too social. Actually, was attending a local psychology um, group. We meet once a month for a community practice, it's called. And um, <clears throat> there was a, a fellow psychologist in that group. I don't didn't know him, um, as in I knew his name, but that was about it. But he was saying how he had a, a couple of girls present, a, a mum, or these two twin girls, wondering if they were autistic. And he said, it was obvious they couldn't be autistic because they both had a friend. That made me cringe. A lot of us have friends. That doesn't mean we can't be on the spectrum of autism. Girls will often mimic others. They may be good at communicating feelings. They might not be. They might be totally unavailable to them. They might be mute in the classroom, but talk at home. There's a whole lot of things that we need to look at. Girls may want to be in the spotlight. They might not want to be in the spotlight. It isn't like one of those works. It's, it, that would be too rigid. It's very different. They may love technology, horses, animals, have friends, etc. Um, and some of the boys will too. Um, girls may live their lives through others. This is more common in the girls than it is in the lads. 
and I, I can remember as a girl, I grew up as a female. Um, the only way I could access school um, was to navigate via watching another girl, and I kind of joined, became a shadow really, which was very uncomfortable for her. But it was the only way I could work out what I needed to do. Um, girls will live with severe anxiety, very often true. May have performance issues. Um, don't set off a less than perfect. Some of the boys as well will do this. Girls may need to twirl, spin, crunch their fingers up inside, oops, sorry, toes up inside their shoes, um, have all sorts of involuntary kind of little ticks. We may not even recognize as ticks as such. You might just think this is part of who they are, and it might be. We might have seen it in grandmother or one of the parents, for example. And they will often follow cues, often true. Difficulty posting lots of information at once and less connected by interest. And that can throw us off the picture because we might see someone who's really good at reading Harry Potter, for example, or, or um, loving animals and, and, and seemingly able to do many things at once. But it's usually within that attention tunnel. It's one interest that will connect them to a, very, a variety of other things. And this is important because if you're autistic and ADHD, and up to 75% of us are, then you might think that we're moving and shifting our attention very quickly, but we often won't finish one thing or we'll come back and finish it uh, after a series of other things, etc. But we have found that monotropic attention in ADHD and autistic people, when there's a combination, it's almost, it's almost stronger. So there's that tendency to focus in there, but easily distractible. And there's lots of these other things on the slides, which I understand will be made available to you. So I mustn't spend lots of time on this. Lots and lots of questions about life, often repeated. Answers may fail to make sense. Difficulty with moving on and letting negatives go. Huge amount of rumination. This happens for um, boys and men as well, but it's more common in girls. Huge amounts of rumination, going over and over the same thing. Very hard to let it go. And if anyone wants to ask me a question about that, I can tell you the things I used to do uh, for that too, for, for what helped. So none of us, autistic or allistic, allistic just means non-autistic. They come from the same kind of Greek source, so it's kind of nice to use um use both of those words some people talk about neurotypical and in that video he talks about neurotypical i slightly worry sometimes because i wonder what neurotypical is but allistic non-autistic or autistic none of us are great at accepting difference individuals may notice more of the bigger social picture if you're allistic might notice more of the bigger social picture if you're allistic so it might be easier to place together piece together things like public and private might not be an issue um but they might have an issue if you're female and autistic you might have an issue not quite knowing when it's the right time to speak some girls i know some females i know will therefore not speak at all others will blurt things out um yeah guys could do this too but that social picture morally more available to females on the spectrum um it's not available to all of us on the spectrum. It's one of those issues that we find we have difficulty with, but it's still more common, I think, in females because of that double X chromosome. But in autism, we may you know, notice less of that bigger picture and be more focused on detail. Now, it's not any old detail. It's only detail of things we're interested in. So in autism, gender and sexuality are more fluid. That's just mean, that just means that they, they they change and they ebb and they flow more. They're not so set for autistic people. And it might be one reason, of course, for the statistics on autism and gender dysphoria. We'll talk more about that soon. In autism, we may not notice other or be aware of public and private as different. I've said this already. Not notice when some behaviours are encouraged or discouraged, um, which will mean even when we get corrected or told off, etc., it can seem like the person is um, wrong <laughs> um, and it's not the right thing to do. And we can build up, especially females, build up some of that resentment and not do 
what we're being asked to do because it doesn't make any sense. People give out instructions and as autistic people, we need things to, we need to understand them. We need to know why. Just telling us that do what I tell you, that can get us into a spot of bother. And if you think about that, if kids always do what adults tell them, autistic kids are being set up for abuse. And uh, that worries me. I've written a book recently released as a, a novel that helps younger autistic people understand discomfort and comfort and to know when it's time to speak up. Um, in this novel, this young person is being abused and they've not noticed. They know they're not comfortable, but they don't know whether it's the right sort of thing to say or not to say because you do what adult, adults tell you. Anyway, so for gender, our internal sense of gender identity, internal sense, it is an internal thing, may be different to sexual orientation. So it might mean you've got a boy here and there's a, or a man, um, a teenager, male, and they might be drawn to other boys or men. They might not have any sexual drawing at all to anything. Asexuality is often not talked about enough. And they might be drawn to the opposite sex. Um, all of these things are just as real for autistic people as they are for allistic people. But gender dysphoria is biological and it's caused by the development of gender identity before birth. Identity before birth. And we'll talk more about that. This condition is not a mental illness. Dysphoria just means a dis, uh, discomfort, um, a break in connection, a sort of sense of that's not me. Um, and it's different to body dysphoria, which is common for young people. Gender dysphoria is different, but it can be hard sometimes to separate those two. The biological sex is determined by chromosomes, which is double X or XY. Your biological sex, as in physical sex. But gender is actually not determined by reproductive organs and genitals, which can say you're male or female. If you look at someone, gender is very different. Gender is often not well understood. And this can lead to all sorts of prejudices and belief systems that tell us the body dictates gender. And this is a, a lack of understanding, really. So we definitely need to be in tune with an individual. Um, means putting aside our own baggage, our own agenda of what we think, which is very hard if you're a parent. As a parent, you're already aware of what lies ahead for your child. You're already aware of how the world will, will take um, or respond or react to a person who's different, not just because of their colour or culture, because of their sexuality and their gender. So it's very hard, very uncomfortable, and we want to protect our kids. Of course we do. But actually walking alongside our young person, even when we don't agree, listening to them, walking step by step, helping them unravel things is so important. If we don't, we could actually miss out on any kind of relationship with that young person. Using, losing a young person's love and connection is awful for a parent. So, so hang in with us, please. Walk with us um, accordingly. So look out for signs and characteristics. And recognizing this is just like any other way of recognizing anything about a person. Um, we need to recognize individual gender and individual sexuality. It may not be the same as that that you, you and I know as parents. Neither of these are set in stone. Um, we only have two words for them, in English anyway, male and female. In some of the American Indians, there is um, three-spirited people. We don't have that outside of that culture. should not be used outside that culture. That's a very culture-specific thing. So reality for male and female is actually quite different. Gender dysphoria, a condition where a person experiences discomfort or distress because there's a mismatch, a mismatch between their biological sex, physically how they're designed, and gender identity. 
biological sex is often assigned at birth, depending on the appearance of the genitals. And that can be um, dodgy, to say the least. Um, there's a whole heap of things that happen for people that can mean a female baby might be born with a larger clitoris that can be mistaken for a penis, and so on. Lots of things can happen. And I'm going to play you a video, tell you a bit more about that in a minute. Over 40% of trans individuals, those are individuals who have felt that dysphoria and that discomfort to such an extent that they've attempted suicide. And many have succeeded. We have a special day every year given to remembering people who have suicided because they've not been welcome in the gender that they know themselves to be. This is really difficult and very uncomfortable. I'm sorry if this causes distress for anybody. But we need to understand the impact on mental health. I want to play you this video. Um, it will be hard for you to find this one. It was on YouTube for a long time. This is a, a friend of mine, or a colleague, I should say. I don't know him well enough to be a friend. But I'd like to play you this. I'm making this video to challenge the belief that being transgender is something that exists only in your mind, that it's all psychological. Um, it is, in fact, a physiological issue, and the misunderstanding arises primarily from the incorrect assumption that gender is an either-or situation. Um, the idea that the only factor that determines gender is the presence or absence of a Y chromosome is incomplete. Um, the way that the body develops is complex and remarkable. Um, here I'm only going to briefly touch on some of the basics which are relevant to gender. To start, the communication that goes on between your cells and between your cells and their environment, um, that communication is done through chemistry. That's the language that your cells use. The presence or absence of chemicals or their relative concentrations to one another. That's all information that your cells take into account when determining how they're going to differentiate. So what cells they're going to turn into, what types of tissues they're going to develop into. Um, up until week seven, the embryos of XX and XY individuals are the same. They have the ability to develop male or female reproductive systems. And it's important to note that um, male and female reproductive systems develop out of the same precursor tissues. Uh, they just need a signal to tell them which pathway to activate. And the importance of the Y chromosome is that it carries the SRY gene, which is considered the master sex determining gene. And what this gene does is it activates a pathway leading to testis formation. Once the testis is developed, it begins producing two hormones, AMH and testosterone. AMH suppresses the ovary formation um, pathway so that they don't produce female hormones. And testosterone, with its derivative DHT, um, they induce the further development of the male reproductive system. Now, the problem lies in the fact that there are an enormous amount of chemicals in our environment these days. Uh, they're ubiquitous. And some of these chemicals, which are called endocrine disrupting chemicals, um, they can cause issues. I, I won't get into the different categories that they fall into, but essentially you can have chemicals that are technically not hormones that your body produces, but they mimic estrogen or they mimic androgen hormones, and they can cause a lot of issues. So what does this mean for tissue that's differentiating, that's trying to figure out what it's supposed to become? Well, for one thing, it, communi it confuses communication. Um, and their potent effects is, um, those effects are hugely magnified in an embryo because it's, it's so tiny. Um, a very small concentration can do a lot. Um, so you expose a developing embryo to the wrong hormones at the wrong time, and what you're essentially doing is sending out signals to those cells and activating or inhibiting pathways that otherwise would not have been. Um, so far I've only mentioned the impact of hormones. 
Um, there are other things which um, impact sex determination, um, especially at the genetic level. Um, I'm just going to list a couple of different situations which can cause variation in sex determination and if you'd like to learn about the others, there's a ton of material on uh, both embryology and developmental bi biology online. And if you have any specific questions, um, I'll do my best to direct you to the relevant literature. Um, so for now, um, for individuals that are that have XX chromosomes, um, there's a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And in this case, um, sorry, my cat is I'm about to climb on the, uh, okay, so come on. all right, so, um, right, uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So in this situation, um, the adrenal glands overproduce androgenic hormones, uh, such as testosterone, and this can cause variation in gender. Also, it has been documented that prenatal exposure to male hormones can have effects on developing embryos. So, for example, uh, medications that the mother has taken. And uh, historically, this has, this has been an issue. Um, they've, they've pulled drugs off of the market because of, because of this effect that they can have. Um, so, um, you can also, also have, obviously, environmental chemicals that I already touched upon. Um, all of these things can impact cell differentiation and development. And um, so for individuals, for example, that are XY chromosomes, um, chemical signaling can be uh, influenced by impaired testicle formation. Um, certain forms of congenital uh, adrenal hyperplasia can also impair the production of male hormones. Um, there's a disorder stemming from a mutation of an enzyme involved in male hormone production called 5A reductase deficiency. So that's another situation. And like I said, there are a, a lot of genetic um, disorders that can influence this as well, which I, I don't have time to really go into those. Um, but for now, I'm going to focus on one specific example um, because it's the one that I used when I was explaining examples of gender variation to my in-laws. And that is androgen insensitivity syndrome. Um, and this occurs in individuals who are genetically XY. So um, normally they would become male. Uh, now let's deconstruct the terminology. So. Um, the androgen refers to androgenic hormones such as testosterone and the insensitivity is referring to the fact that the cells that are supposed to be receiving these hormones are insensitive to them. So even if their bodies are producing sufficient levels of testosterone, those developing tissues don't get the message. Um, and without those instructions, they differentiate to the default, which is female reproductive genitalia, etc. Um, so, you get a genetically male child who is born looking every bit female. They are declared to be female on their birth certificate, they are raised female, they grow up as female, and most people who have this condition don't find out about it until they reach puberty and don't menstruate. Um, or if they're trying to become pregnant later on and they can't. So, when people, people find out about this, it's understandingly um, quite shocking to them and reactions certainly vary. Um, some people choose to undergo gender reassignment um, but many of them just get on estrogen um, since their bodies aren't producing the normal female hormones and they continue living happily as women. Um, so this is an example of a well-documented uh, medical syndrome whereby gender is absolutely not um, either or. Um, and as I said, this is just one example. Um, apparently my dog wants to be in the video as well. Um, 
Okay, so one more thing about development that I wanted to make sure and explain is that gender determination is not a one-off event. There are, there are multiple stages at which variation can occur. And one of these most important distinctions is between the development of reproductive systems and neurological development. So the fascinating thing is that these two determining stages do not occur simultaneously. So what this means is that if you have abnormal hormone levels at one stage, but not at the other stage, you can get a physiological mismatch. Um, so for example, if an XX individual receives normal female hormone concentrations during genital development, that person will be, have female reproductive systems um, and be assigned female at birth. Um, but if that same embryo was exposed to excessive androgenic hormones during its neurological development, then the baby's brain is going to be um, wired as, as, a, as a male brain. Um, now, I'm not saying that males and females have these completely differently structured brains. Okay? There is, like everything else, huge variation along the spectrum of, of all different types of variables. Um, but there are differences in general. Um, and the um, gender identity um, does exist within the neurological framework. I mean, you're born with an innate sense of who you are. Um, everyone really can attest to this, especially transgender people. No matter how strongly um, society and their families push them to be one gender, it cannot change this innate sense of who they are. Even if we're really good at adapting ourselves to fit societal norms, you just can't erase that innate identity um, wherever it lies along the spectrum. And that's because it's, it's wired neurologically. Um, so that's, that's a really fascinating thing, and, and there's a lot of new research coming out, there's a lot of research being done, and I'm really very excited to learn more about it as that research is done. Um, but my main hope in explaining some of this is to alleviate shame and stigma. Um, being transgender is not a mental disorder, it's an endocrine disorder. Um, it's hormones. You were born with a unique body, not a lesser body. And if hormones and surgery can help bring your body more into alignment with how your brain is wired, then that's something that you should pursue. Um, if you're happy with your body, and maybe you just want to live a, a more androgynous lifestyle and not do any of the hormones or surgery, that's okay too. Okay, it, like I said, it, it's a spectrum. There are multiple stages where variation can occur. Um, I know that this journey is challenging, and the world doesn't exactly make it easy for us, which is why it's that much more important for us to not make it harder on ourselves by judging ourselves. Um, I have felt the shame, and I have felt the self-hatred and the embarrassment. Um, it holds you down, it holds you back from living a happy and fulfilled life. This journey is a hard one. We do it because the destination is worth it. Um, don't make it harder on yourself by weighing yourself down with the shame and judgments of others. Um, I'm going to leave that there because I'm recognizing how much time is moving away from me. So the, the central thing, the, the thing I want to emphasize there is there's no blame on parents. There is no judgment. It's not about that. And the biggest thing most of us feel as trans people um, is that hormones happening pre-birth while we're in utero, um, causing us to physically look one way, we're different when our neurological system was being formed and gender is within the neurological system not the physical one and that's the big thing to take away it's 
happening there before we're born. It took me a long time to connect to this because of my autism. I blamed um, my understanding of gender and sexuality on things like sensory stuff or a whole heap of other things to do with being autistic. And it took me a long time to connect. I was 62 before those things. That's over 10 years ago before I recognized my true gender. Um, some people may connect to it much, much earlier. Obviously, we're all very different. It's a spectrum. Um, we need to have conversations with our young people about gender and about sexuality. Now, this is really, really important. The big porn industries make millions of dollars, make more money. Um, the biggest porn industry makes more money than Amazon, um, et cetera, than Facebook, et cetera. So it's important that we understand if we don't have conversations with our young people, if our own baggage gets in the way, our own fears, they will look elsewhere. And porn is so readily available. It pops up on your mobile phone, on any device, even the gaming computer. And as an autistic person, we're often very curious and we'll often click on things. And very quickly, our attention is drawn away. And because we're so mono, monotropic, unfortunately, we're at greater risk than every other young person. And porn's an issue for everybody. But as autistic people, it's even stronger. So I would encourage you, if you want to look up tip sheets, how to start a conversation, for example, go to Porn is Not the Norm, that little website I've got down there, and check us out. There's also training and all sorts of things available online so that, to help us with our young people, autistic young people, and their sexuality in particular. So studies on gender dysphoria, and there's lots of them, um, show that there seems to be an increase amongst autistic people more likely to live with gender dysphoria. So that that places us in that 40% towards mental health issues, suicide and so on. You don't come back from that. You don't come back from that. So it's really important to get the right support. I like to use this sort of a poster when I'm working with a young person. Lots of people might not like it, but it shows where you can find which part of who we are. And some, some young autistic people are quite visual, and I'm not, but some are, and we need to know what is what, and this can be very helpful. Drew, if you've been to Drew's Planet, Drew says, I've recently been making exciting and very daunting discoveries about my gender. As a result, I currently, currently identify as 30% George Clooney, 70% Georgina Clueless. I'm frankly, frantic, sorry, I'm frantically researching all the posh names for where I'm at, and I'm guessing that I'm non-binary, so I'm not kind of stuck with one thing or another when it comes to gender. I'm genderqueer with a degree of gender fluidity. Essentially, I live on planet Drew, which has an erratic rotation around the gender system. Currently quite close to Venus. I'm an adult fan of Logo, Lego, sci-fi geek, Doctor Who fan, who would not be, and the occasional gamer. I've also discovered that I can do liquid eyeliner, which is nice. Now, this is a very different picture to a lot of us expecting how an autistic young person might turn out, how any person um, might want to be working out who they are. And it's the 70% clueless thing we need to focus on here. So walk with us through our sexuality, through our gender journey. Please don't let big porn industries be our default educator. So we can work hard to understand the autism spectrum. We need to understand monotropism. We can work hard to assist our kids and young people build social skills and propriety, knowing the difference between public and private, for example. We work hard to develop appropriate values about consent, about relationship, about love, about good sex. We also need to check on any unwanted baggage that we might be carrying that's clouding our thinking and preventing us from seeing what it is that's before us when we're working together with our young people. So we need to deal with that. We need to let that go. And that's not easy. And sometimes we let something go and we pick it up again. we got to let it go again. It's something we need to revisit frequently. So it's important to understand in conclusion, typical gender, typical sexuality, there is no such thing. 
Learning to let go of prejudice and know an individual's disposition, individual disposition is critical. Teenage years, depression, suicide, mental illness are often linked to gender and sexuality issues. So being aware of prevention is better than cure. Prevention is better than cure. There is no cure for what's happening to us gender-wise and sexuality-wise. And there is no cure if we're dead. There's no cure coming back from those things. We need to walk together on this. So some other things like my um, web page, various pages to check out, and that YouTube uh, video that I showed and so on. Um, just to leave you on this page, while we have some time for questions, a uh, book that my wife and I have written together there, Transitioning Together, because if you do transition and you already are in a relationship, this impacts not just your family, as in family of origin, but your partner. So it's important to understand what's happening there. So I'll stop chatting, and Denise will let us know what questions I need to, to address. Thank you. Okay, so people are typing their questions into the Q&A section. Um, we do have a chat as well, but I'm going to ask people to type them in the Q&A. So if you have some questions you'd like when to answer, be sure to type them now. Uh, the first question that we got now, when when is in Australia? So uh, the, if people have specific questions about legislation or funding in the U.S., when can't necessarily address those, but maybe one could talk about how they've made progress in Australia. Uh, this first question is about um, healthcare bills that have been passed in the US that are anti-trans and um, how independent autistic adults on Medicaid have struggled with this. And I know that you've had similar struggles in Australia. Can you share a little bit about how advocacy efforts have been effective and what people did during those times? Yes, it's an ongoing battle and it makes me very sad that we can be so rigid. And once a law is passed, your, high, your hands are tied. Um, in Australia, there, we don't really have surgical interventions. You can, if you've got breasts and you can show that they're too heavy and they're causing you discomfort, perhaps giving you back problems, you might get your breasts removed. And there is possibly one plastic surgeon who will do this privately, but certainly not um, a whole sex transition surgically, that's not available. Uh, I had to go outside of Australia, I went outside of my country, I raised the money and, and got surgery um, elsewhere. It's not ideal because you've got to come back to your own country and you need care. You need to continue living as you are. And if ongoing care medically is not available, this is a big issue. It's a big issue all around the world. And in some places, it's still a crime to be gay to be um, trans, to be not seen as the usual, um, is difficult for anybody. So I, I, I wish there was a solution. We just got to keep battling away. It is important that we keep away from toxic others. And that sometimes can mean our own families. And this is really hard. I've been very fortunate. I have a family who welcome who I am. That's not so for everybody. But finding others of like mind outside your family, if necessary, is so important because, as I said, the issues of mental health and suicidality are huge in our population. As we keep dripping and dripping away, I believe that we can make changes to some of those laws, but you've got to be very careful. You've got to look after yourself in this process, and I appreciate that. So in that vein, you talked a bit about mental health. Can you talk about, I mean, you're a psychologist, so uh, resources people could look for if they're looking for mental health therapy or support? What, what would they be looking for in a caregiver um, who would ably help them through that? Obviously, ideally, you want someone who's on side, who's accepting of who you are. There's a lot of resources, written material in books, for example. Jessica Kingsley, who publishes widely in the States and in Canada um, and across the world, um, has a number of books on sexuality and how to explain that to young people as they're growing up. There's also a number of books on gender. Um, we've written the Trans Guide to Life for Autistic People, and it's called the Trans Guide to Life. Um, there are some brilliant web pages. I've put a couple in the resources. Electric Dade. Dade is amazing. Um, he lives in Portland. And, uh, yeah, as a, as a trans person, um, but following his story was 
the only thing that kept me going when I was transitioning, we transitioned about six months apart. And uh, that was brilliant. I totally recommend him, Finn the Invincible. There's another link I've put up there to follow people's stories and what they did and what they what they found useful and not. And it's different for everybody. But it's important to join a community of like mind and hopefully a carer, a parent, a support person uh, will also help you see. And our also our training on porn is not the norm. It's so important because there's loads of um, materials. Some are free, some are very small amount, like $30 to join up. So I recommend both of those. So can I ask you, would you go back to that resource slide? We've had a couple of people say, hey, we want to see those links again. So so uh, the one that ends up DS01, the top of DS01, mm -hmm. is the one about the, the um, monotropism, how, the, how autism what we believe autism is. These are more on gender dysphoria, um, uh, various conditions, and you can see the lower slide down there for Dade. And I think Finn is, if Finn is, I can't find him on there, but if you type into a Google search, F-I, Finn the Invincible, um, you'll find him. And, and and I'm very happy to email with people should they wish um, to find out more. There's Finn and uh, yeah, Finn T, Finn the Invincible, and his video, his journey. They're all journeys over many years. So and um, with video content, that's important. Um, yes, I go back to there. Uh, and I'm, uh, my email address is all lowercase no space. W E N B for Bobby E, then a number two, Wemby two at outlook.com. And I'll put that in the chat for you there. I'm going to put that in there. Yeah, sure. All right. Thanks, Wen. Um, so this next thing's a comment and a quick question. Um, thank you, Wen. I'm a proud mama of a trans son who is also on the spectrum. What is the name of the book you mentioned for kids on discomfort? I'll have to look that up and send you send that to you. Okay. Um, I've written the book. I've written is called the um, it's Jesse's diary. Uh, the words are fully escaping me, but it's um, yeah. I'll send it to you. Okay, I'll send it to Denise and you, and feel free to check it out. But it's um, it's available on Imgram Spark, so it's a self published book. And I, I'll send out more more information to Denise. Okay, great. And we can add that to the, the page, the playback page after I get it. <clears throat> so another question. Um, just, yeah, that, that mom's thanking you for answering that question. Um, this person says, labels are important, but also often dis difficult to parse. That's why I like the term neuroqueer. I cannot separate my neurology from the other aspects of my identity. And then they shared a link. Um, called neuroqueer.com. Super. <laughs> Excellent. Yep. An individual with autism has received a lot of conflicting messages about how they, quote, should, and quote, show up in a hugely neurotypical world. This leads to significant distortions in identity. How would you advise young individuals on the spectrum to sort through which identity truly aligns with theirs? How could you yeah. be most supportive around this? It is really difficult and really hard. The world that just being autistic is traumatic because the world isn't made for us. So growing up as an autistic person, we already have lots of trauma and inherent um, sometimes self, self-hate, self-doubt, um, poor self-esteem just being autistic all of those things because the world already says you shouldn't stim you should do this you should be like that um, you should look at me when I talk to you etc so all of those things and all of those things are also inherent in discovering and working out gender and sexuality so it's really important that we are around others who think like us others who affirm our autism affirm our sexuality affirm our gender and if we're unsure affirm our unsureness it's okay to be unsure let's walk through this together let's explore together 
don't let fear dictate. Don't let fear dictate. It's more important that we get to know our humanity and, and who we are as people. And we need people who are uh, in touch with their own humanity and can walk with us safely, lovingly, encouragingly through that. Anything that is not born out of love, respect, consent, I reject. I reject. But sorting those things out as an autistic person, I used to say yes to everything because it got me into less trouble than no. So understanding public and private um, and what sensory stuff, what is autism, what is monotropism, all of those things are, are a foundation to supporting us through the rest of what we have to ne ne negotiate. And sometimes it's not safe to say how you feel or think. So we need to be in a safe space to share those things and to be affirmed in some of those things. Um, and there's lots of unsafe places, but understanding and working those things out, we need support. So uh, one of our attendees today shared several interesting links. Uh, the first is about the Trevor Project. So mm -hmm. the leading suicide and prevention and crisis intervention nonprofit org for LGBTQ plus young people. Um, they said we provide information and support for these young people. So if people want to check out the Trevor Project, I know that's frequently discussed here in the US. So if you're not familiar with it, you may want to take a look. Mm -hmm. um, that same sure. person also sent a couple other links. So if you're in the in the uh, Q&A, you can see those. One comment was, it would be remiss not to mention intersex people and the fact that there may be many more sex chromosome variations than XX and XY. And then they Absolutely. shared some, some helpful links there. So um, I can put those in the chat as well. Yes, please, intersex. I have some uh, personal history with this, is uh, uh, not understood. And uh, we need to be talking much more um, about being asexual, um, being an intersex person, which is much more physiological. Um, yeah, thanks for those resources. That's great. Yep. Okay, so we're almost out of time, but I'm going to ask one last question here. And I don't know if you can answer this or not, but it, it's uh, I don't want to skip it. I have two children, both with male genitalia at birth. Both are neurodiverse and 2E. My older son has an autism diagnosis and ADHD diagnosis. My younger has an ADD diagnosis and is transgender. She received a neuropsych eval when she was quite young and I and the provider evaluated for aut autism as a male. Is it possible that a reevaluation as a female would have a different result? Have you seen that, anything like that? Mm. Um, yes, it is possible. I'm not sure I would recommend it if it adds more discomfort to the young person. But that's one of the things I've had to battle with, the very different experience as a, a guy to was as growing up with female hormones um, and female sex chromosomes because my gender pulled me one way, my body pulled me another, and my responses in the outside world have changed. I'm certainly much more confident and capable in my right gender as a guy um, and some of that has caused difficulties because my family hadn't known me in that respect. Another assessment for me for my autism wouldn't help because my autism is well established. And I know I've come to know that very um, staggered profile, which is what we see in autistic people. And I'm very monotropic. There's a monotropism questionnaire on the monotropism website. And it's um, I recommend people do that questionnaire. It's very interesting to see what our traits are and if you do it and then compare uh which you might not be able to but if you do it is interesting to see some of those differences we don't want to do any harm so our our governing choice must be to do no harm 